Hi, and welcome back to my studio. I thought I would do a live video for you today. And I'm going to try and do one of these a week through this holiday period. One of the things I've been talking about quite a lot is starting a painting. And I've got a short free course that I offer. You can see it in the links in this video as well and other videos. And it's about working on a composition for your painting and, and how important is it? We mostly talk about color and brushwork, but without that critical start with your composition, everything thereafter can go badly wrong. If your color is great and your composition is not working, the painting is not going to really be very effective. So I'm going to show you why I've created this little course as well and give you an idea of what you can do with this information when you're approaching your subject and uh, getting started. So I'm going to go into um, my easel now and just show you the reference I'm going to be working from and start with composing that in a very simple form, just using felt tip markers. And then maybe we have time to start the painting and just proceed with it and, and see what we can achieve. So let's have a, a quick visit to the easel over there. And you, now you can see that reference. And one of the important things with the composition is of course choosing a strong subject. And with this reference, you can see that it's a, a pathway and there's light and dark objects. And that is so important. It is the contrast, of course, between light and dark that makes such a big impact in any painting. So when I look at this subject and I start thinking about it, the first thing I'm going to do is, is just try and do a quick little no-tan study. And I've just got a bit of scrap paper and a black felt of marker and start off with the format of the painting. Do you want it portrait format or landscape, panorama, square? These are things to consider right from the very start, okay? They have a big impact. Now, I'm gonna work with the photo is in a portrait format and I quite like the way that's set out. So the next thing I'm gonna look at is where am I gonna put my horizon line? Everything must relate to that. I don't wanna put it straight in the middle and then give each side this equal sharing of space. With painting, normally we want some asymmetry or an unequal relationship in space between shapes. So I'm going to move it up above the halfway point. And then I'm going to go straight into getting the darkest shapes in. And one thing I want to do is have the sunlight that's over on the edge here of the reference. I'm going to move it further over to the, uh, I'll say this was right on the right hand edge. I'm going to move it slightly over to the left. It's just attracting the eye too close to the edge. Over here. I don't want the edge of the painting getting all the attention. I want the eye in the painting. So we're going to move that burst of bright light more to the left and engage the eye in the heart of the painting. That famous rule of thirds, that's where we want people to be looking at. 
And as I squint by closing my eyes slightly, it defines all the dark shapes very easily. And makes it quite simple to work out where all the darks are. I'm not worried about details. I'm leaving those out. I just want that strong dark. Now, most of this painting is, in fact, going to be with shadow family colors, strong dark values. And even the shadow across here also very dark. There's going to be a few lights on the pathway, but for the most part, these are strong dark shadows. So this painting is, however, still about light. Light and strong darks. And that makes a really effective composition because we are attracted to contrast. Okay, so I'm going to have my sun coming through there and filtering into these leaves around it. There's going to be some light breaking through into the pathway and some strong warm light into the middle distance and far distant. So those will all be influenced by aerial perspective, but the main attraction is going to be these dark overhanging trees and the warm light showing through and heading into the color or light spots on the path. And I think that will make a strong composition. So that's my starting point and where I assess the composition. Now you take this and you just put it to the side where you can refer to it and to remind yourself of what it is you're going to be painting. Now in the course I'm talking about, I'll show you how to do good notan compositions and, and what you should also avoid. And then we're going to go into translating that onto your canvas very quickly. Using a big brush, we've got some ultramarine, a little bit of burnt sienna, and that makes a strong natural dark because that's what we want. We want strong natural darks. I don't want to use black paint because in nature, there's actually a lot of color in dark shapes. When you go out and you look at the shadows, you don't just see black color. You are seeing plenty of shadow family colors. You can even put a little drop of alizarin crimson in to get a, a, almost a purple shape. And now I'm going to get this, that dark shape in pretty much as I did with a felt tip marker and just loosely get in my composition. There was that horizon line and get this all into place. There'll be lots of sky holes in this. Making quite an effective um, composition. All right, there's a question there. Liz, would you not just be guided by the picture for orientation? Very often, I will look at a photograph and try and decide if I need to crop that photo. Sometimes a photographer when you're working with stock photos, especially, and you're looking for something like that, a photographer is very often looking at a subject differently to a painter. Very often a photographer is going to actually put something in the center of the photo as the focal point, whereas as a painter, I don't want that. The problem with painting from photographs is we are very much influenced into painting the entire scene as it appears in the photo. But the correct approach is ask yourself, how much can I crop down in this photo? 
Do I have to follow it as it appears? And cropping a, a, a photo also gives you many different options. Gives you, you could probably get two, three paintings out of one photograph simply by cropping it differently each time. So there we're pretty much blocked in from this little note and study into a two value painting version or painted version of the note onto the canvas. And you can actually take your tissue paper if you want and just finesse it a bit, remove some of the thicker paint. If you feel in this area, we're going to be lightening things up a bit with all of that sunlight. Take some of the thicker paint away and you'll easily paint straight over it. You basically stained your canvas over here as well, a bit more light. It will be what we'd say is a middle value, a light middle value or a dark middle value. This is going to be a middle value, but a lighter one. So I just want to get some of that. The shadow edge is going to be a bit softer and there's some filtered light coming into it. I'll lighten that up a little. And these holes on the pathway are very much like scar holes in a tree. But this is fine. I'll leave that as it is. And for the rest, that'll do. Now you've covered so much of the surface. It's OK. So since we usually, in oils and even acrylics, work from dark to light. And so let's start working in that area. Now, OK, this all falls within the darks, but not all of it is black or approaching black. These, these colors are dark but quite warm, influenced by a lot of light. This could be a sunrise or sunset. It's very similar. So I'm using an orange. You can mix your orange, of course. But for convenience, I'm going to use the orange and some of that blue that's left over and start blocking in these warm middle values. And they fade and get darker as they move away from the bright light. You can use some of your self-expression here as well. Uh, maybe bring in some alizarin crimson. And you can see how easy that goes straight over wet ultramarine mix. And I'm already getting a form of gradated color. And over here, furthest away, it's quite a strong shadow, but it's, it's also got to be cool. Here we've got the warm light. In the shadow, we'll have cool, cool color. If the light is warm, the shadows must be cool. I like to use cerulean blue for really cool shadows. For, if you want really cold, Maybe in a snow scene, you could try cobalt blue, which is very cold in color temperature. All right, so these are quite dark. They're far away from the light and much cooler. And we're just finessing that a little. Soften these edges. The gradations are normally quite gentle. So we got that in. 
there's some warm light on the top of the tree. Just look where else you, you're seeing this. And across the path, even further away from the light, it must be quite cool. So mostly cerulean, a little bit of that orange, I'm getting quite a cool light here onto that grass. So that's fine. Keep cleaning my brush off with some tissue paper. Okay, now I'm gonna look at this path. Um, I'm seeing a lot of cool shadow and where there's some warmth coming through, it's leaning to a warmer violet. So between those two, I've got to work out something. And I'm not actually sure what the local color of this path is. What is it when it's not being influenced by the light? Um, and I would probably say it is very light. Um, maybe even a touch of pink coming into it. But in this sort of light, I'm going to use I'm going to use white, titanium white, a little bit of yellow ochre, a bit of that orange to suggest the color of the, the light part of it. Maybe even a little warmer with white and a bit of cadmium yellow. So you put that down and you just have a look. Does it read correctly? I'm going to leave it that way because I want it light and warm and to contrast a lot more with the shadow. Now, as the light approaches the shadow, it's getting a bit of that shadow coming through and filtering it. It does get darker in value, it's still warm. So I'm, I'm adjusting it by putting a little bit of orange in there. There's alizarin crimson, there is the white as well. Soften that edge. And that I think will do as the transition, just taking it over. There's going to be some light over here. Okay. Yes, true. I, I am painting this in oils, which is my, my typical medium. And, and I like the oils mostly because I can do probably a few more things with them. Especially, I like the slow drying time. But acrylics will do this exercise just as well. All right, so there's the light and the path meeting over there. Okay, then I'm getting into the much darker value where this tree is casting the shadow. And I can see that it's particularly cool let's say along here, across to there. Sort of the heart of the cast shadow from the tree. So more cerulean blue, touch of white, I do want it opaque. There's a bit of, a little bit of alizarin. I'm gonna make it darker near the base of the tree and it'll get lighter as it moves across. There's a diagonal line, which I will emphasize. I like diagonal shadows. It adds some energy to ground. A bit of warmth is coming into the light, which means for me, a little bit of alizarin crimson. And I'm just going to block in as much shadow and then I'm going to cut in 
with some lights. I also paint shadows much thinner than I do light areas. With light areas, I'll put in a lot more impasto. In shadows, I keep them pretty thin. All right, so I'll come back over that with some impasto shadows. Let's have a look at the middle value colors in the landscape beyond, as well as some of those sky holes, and then we'll come back to this light. Okay, now these are quite warm colors. More of the yellow, cadmium yellow, a little bit of white, just to get that opaqueness to it. And there is a little bit of green And we cut in there. And we go right up. This tree can come down a bit. Actually, it's a bit high. So this will all really landscape showing through. Just block that in fairly quickly. This is, as I said, still a block-in stage. And I'll re refine shapes as we go. Just trying to see at where that pathway leads to. It leads away and gets quite cool, but still fairly light in value. And then there's a shadow along the path. Okay, I must have a re-look at this tree. I'm going to just relate it. And actually, I'm going to put it here. Right there. And with some ultramarine, just get that value correct. OK, now I've got the lightest light to work on, and that's the sky colors. And that means quite a bit more white paint. But the sky is quite warm. Be Put in a little bit of orange, just a little touch of alizarin, a bit more white. I always try to bring in a bit more color after I put white paint in. White is so cold. And I am painting over some dark there, so I'm going to try and do it in one stroke. And just a quick question, Joanna. What makes blocking in different from underpainting, or are they the same? I think underpainting is very um, light and is more of setting a tone, maybe a little more, a little more than simply a flat tone of of color. But if you if you understand it as the same thing, that underpainting into uh, a stronger version, and you're hitting, when you're finished with the blocking, and if it's done well, you're halfway through the painting. So I put a lot more paint down when I'm doing a blocking. It's just about getting the, the big shapes and you could say perhaps in your blocking you end up with 10 to 14 shapes with quite a lot of paint as well. From that point on, you can just develop them fairly 
quickly to finish your painting. I always say, if you get this stage right, you got your composition and you're blocking them, you're halfway home. Underpainting, very, very often artists use the underpainting to start feeling out the composition. But we're going further now. Now, I'm just adjusting a few of those shapes there, just I want them a little lighter. I want to cut in there a bit. And even that is starting to suggest the distant countryside. You could take a few, play around with color temperature, a few warmer. And you already start getting a sense of things. I, I want to just probably take this over a bit with some branches, things like that. Just break that up a bit. Link up these two shadows here. Yeah. I should have done that earlier. And I'm painting straight over those lights. So I've just got to make a quick brush stroke. Otherwise, I mix into those whites and my shadows disappear. You want to keep white paint out of your shadow colors. I see quite a strong dark there. I just want to get that back in place. All right. So I think it's time to play around with the light over here. That's sort of the fun part. And now let's get the the sort of center, the apex of that light in. And I'm now I'm going to use some white, a little bit of cadmium yellow. And I'm very cautious about putting red into that. I don't want to end up with a cold peach shape. So I'm going to stick to that yellow and white. Just put that in. I will make it smaller. So now let's get some of that orange. Let's get some of that cadmium yellow. And it rapidly change it. That gradation goes from light to dark very quickly. Let's get that going again. Now the branches and things like that, I can go over those just now. Let's just work on a gradation of color. A little bit of alizarin. As the color darkens, it cools down very quickly. Now we've got some really nice orangey greens. And let's put that in. So the light is filtering downwards and moving from orange to warm greens. And of course, that means it's cooling down pretty quickly. Over here, just a glow of more of a burnt sienna. Let's bring some yellow into it. 
And that's probably two lines. A little touch of ultramarine. That's better. This will just help to define the shape a bit as well. Very little white paint shadows, as I've said. And of course, when you're dealing with this sunset or sunrise silhouette, very little um, light and the form of white paint must come into it. You, you'll lose those colors so fast with white. It's just too cold. Right, quite a bit more ultramarine as we get up to here. I can bring just a touch of orange into that. I don't want it too cold. Now uh, there's some darks coming over that burnt sienna, linking up over here. Over there, the coldest yet, so I'll throw in a little bit of cerulean. I'll break up these edges slightly. Um, possible to angle your easel a little. Uh, not at this moment, Liz. Um, it's more about keeping glare off the easel, so that's a bit worse. I think. But look for the, the broad strokes here. This is about big shapes. That's the main thing. Just to show you how quick operation to reach this point. Um, I'm not quite sure how long we've been painting, probably about 20 minutes. So you can really go a long way. The strength of this is about getting your big shapes over as much of the painting as possible. In fact, the entire painting as fast as you can. Just get the big shapes of value and color temperature. Let's get a few bits over there. Okay, now I'll look at this again. You can stand across the room, have a look, and see maybe we want to just get a few lights breaking through over there. Soften edges. As you develop the painting, keep softening up edges. Except where you want a firm edge to attract the eye. So yeah, I'm just trying things. Just seeing if I bring a bit more light through there. Definitely a bit more green coming down here. Filtering through. Actually coming right through to there. And then I can obviously go over these lights with some dark shapes to suggest branches or um, even some clusters of leaves. But I'm certainly not going to try and paint individual leaves. That's not what we're about. We're about letting the big shapes suggest. Suggestion is... For the impressionist, it's fundamental. We want to suggest things, not paint in tremendous detail. A bit more warmth over here. Perhaps that's a bit too light. Bit of burnt sienna. Okay, I'm going to leave that for now over there. And we're going to look at this shadow. 
So a bit of that cerulean, some alizarin. What do you do with with the shadow to make it? I think maybe play around with color temperature. The value is fairly established. You've got to keep the value. Right from the very start, we've worked this out as a strong dark, and we can't lose that. It has to remain. So all we can do is put temperature and shift that around. Um, okay. Yes, Liz. Okay. I will move things when I'm finished and we'll so remember this shadow being thrown by the tree that's the that's the coldest shadow and it will get more light into it as we get here where there's more filtered light even your darkest shadow can have some interest into it. So I can, if it's visible here, bring in a very dark green. And over here, this actually is quite a strong edge in a more or less the focal point of the painting. So we want a fairly strong contrast between light and dark here. Going up to here. And this strong edge kind of helps to lead the eye as well. A bit more over there. And the painting just begins to fall into place by itself. And I have used a number eight brush. This is actually a number six, but it's quite worn. It's quite spread out. Try and keep the little brushes away for as long as possible. And we put a bit of burnt sienna and have sort of a warm dark here. Some of that filtered sunlight. There's a few overlapping branches and tree shapes over here, sort of clusters of leaves that suggest that as well. I'm seeing some warm green. Let's put some of those. And around sky holes, you'll get a bit more filtered light, so you can soften those edges there and bring in a little bit of warmth into the, the greens around sky holes. Lots of ways to, to develop the painting. All right, let's, let's bring in some light into the pathway. And from what I can see, it looks like warm violet. I'm actually going to put in a little touch of orange, and that, that violet goes very gray. Don't make it into mud. If it looks muddy, throw in blue or alizarin. And just lighten that value. Put in a bit more white. Just can see it gets very cold. Always ask yourself, does it need to be warmer or cooler? Whatever color you're putting down. And there's the smaller the hole of light, the darker it will be. Same principle as in a scar hole in a tree. So 
smaller hole, less light, therefore darker. And yeah, I think it pretty much is suggesting the light coming through, sort of bigger patches here. When you develop your painting in the final stage, stand across the room, have a look and see. And you may, you may notice what needs to be changed. Okay, that transition color. I could use a larger brush and just drop in one shape there, but this would be something I'd do in the sort of latter stages of the painting, getting very close to a finished painting. Now this is a small painting, it's more of a color study, but it can be quite effective still. We need to now start reestablishing some darks. There'd be some shadows along the road, or this path. I want to soften this edge up. Okay, these dark lines are too big, of course. So, some warm white, just make them a bit smaller. And then the lightest light, actually that will be white and that little bit of this orange yellow. with some strong impasto. Let's widen that up a bit. Okay, in the landscape itself, I can see lines and, and a few shapes, but I'm gonna suggest them very loosely it's just not enough space to try and do any more than that. And the painting's not about that distant landscape. It's about the light coming through the tree and the pathway. Perhaps just to suggest a time of day, a light effect. That's, that's really what we paint. I've taken this further than merely a demonstration of how to start. Some of these strokes are things I would do in the final pass. I've taken that a bit too low. Okay, now I need more sky holes in the tree. The sky is a warm light. And so let's get some white. As I said, the smaller sky hole will be a little darker. But you, you do it as you need. All right, these, these skull holes further away from the sunlight will get cooler. So there is cerulean, there's white, little touch of yellow, and it makes it almost a bluish green. So that's, to my mind, that's what happens when you've got 
light in this sort of yellow spectrum and a blue sky, you get that greenish, a light greenish look. Just a few. I think we can get a little bit more adventurous around here. Let's bring in some warm, warm greens, break this up a bit. All right, now we've got some branches and things like that going across the, the source of light. What happens is that there's a type of um, refraction effect. So a smaller branch might look kind of orange. It's still gonna be dark, but it's not gonna be cold. So let's say uh, take a branch over here and that may give the impression of a branch across the light. A bit of a lizard, the yellow. White is such a cold color, titanium white. Okay, so that is just a bit. Make that a bit lighter. Okay, so I just cut in a bit and you can see that branch. Going up here. And branch over there. And let's just put one in here. Okay, now, this is now very wet and quite thick paint. So if you're gonna work with it any further, you've got to put your color down in sort of one stroke so you don't get muddy paint. But I'm going to just put a few lights in there. I've got to try and decide if I'm, I'm happy with the lightest light. That may be okay. If you want to try and create sort of light beams, um, remember that's a camera effect, so it might not really be a good idea to try that in paint, but you can, you can try and just blur a few edges perhaps. Just play around, see if you like it. I quite like this sort of hello of warm light up here. Decide if that works. All right, so I've gone quite far with this. I I'm intended to just play around with Starting. Let's let's just suggest a few holes up in here. A few sparks of light. Uh, 
I'm going to bring in bring in a little highlight or two in that landscape. Just take the eye into the distance. And maybe we're feeling adventurous. We can even have a figure add a bit of scale. All right, need, I need a little brush, a little rigger brush like this. Some tissue, clean this off. Can get quite messy. And perhaps a figure over here. And it's mostly just sort of a pear shape. And then a leg and another one, one longer than the other. Small head. Make one leg quite a bit longer than the other. It does suggest walking. Shadow. Just need to cut in a little. All right. Um, I think that is about all I'm, I can show you at the moment. And uh, let's get the tape off. And just get a clean edge and have a look at this color study, this quick development of the painting painted in a sort of loose and impressionist fashion. And let's see if I can just straighten that up a bit for you. I'll compare it to the reference. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but there, so that's the, that's a loose impression to try and play around with the light and the lights and the darks, etc. So you, you can definitely have a look at the little free course, see how you can learn how to take your reference to the dark black and white two value note and study, translate that onto your canvas, and then go over it and develop the, the colors. All right, I hope that's shed a bit of light one way or the other on the whole idea of the um, color studies, etc., and uh, value studies into color. And uh, try it out for yourself, just play around with it and have fun. And I, I'll be doing a few more of these little live maybe one a week for the next three weeks into the new year. Well, have fun with that and uh, see you again soon. And please, I hope you enjoy. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Cheers for now.